I'm accomplishing justice. Okay. And this is my motivation. Justice, it's my goal. And the fact that I'm able to help people reach that goal and accomplish justice, it's what I do mm. and what drives me. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of New York 100. Today, I'm sitting with a very special guest, someone with over a decade of experience in law here in New York. She's been named New York's top 10 immigration lawyers. She's been featured in Bumble, and she's sitting here with you today to give you some advice. Disclaimer, this is not, this, yeah, I had to say this, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is not supplement for any professional legal advice. I do have to say that right up front, but if you do want to get in contact, I'll leave the information her, about her in the link below. But anyways, let's get to it. We're going to be talking about immigration. We're going to be talking about divorce. She does a full range of legal services, but I want to tap into those two today, and if you need any more expertise, you can get in contact. So without further ado, Maria. Hello. Mateo. Mateo. Mateo, that is correct. Yes. Oh, nice to finally meet you. Yes, it's a pleasure. Yes. Our email chain was like full of exclamation points. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'm very excited to you know to speak with you today. I do want to speak on just I know you do a full range of um, legal services. I wanted to speak on just primarily to um, again uh, immigration and divorce. So first off, you know at the beginning, initially like so why did you decide? to become a lawyer? That's a very good question, and I cannot ask that question without mentioning my mother. Oh, okay. My mother is an attorney in the Dominican Republic, and she's currently a DA, mm. um, meaning That's... a district attorney. Okay. So she persecutes crime. Mm -hmm. um, she went to law school when I was um, already Big, maybe six, seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. um, she was, um, you know, an assistant to an attorney, and the attorney said, "You know what, Maria, you have too much to offer. You should go to law school. Mm -hmm. You're very smart." And, you know, she started. She went to law school mm -hmm. while I was going to school, mm -hmm. and I saw her. How I, I saw how she grew how she became an attorney. I used to go with her to law school and just do my homework outside mm. her classroom. So I grew up with that and she quickly became, you know, a traffic um, enforcement mm. judge. Mm. And then she went to um, be an assistant district attorney. And now she is a district attorney in the Dominican Republic. I used to go with her uh, during the summers to work with her. And it was just natural. I just fell in love with the profession and um, the ability to be able to help people. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And I was all, always very clear mm -hmm. that when I grew up, I just wanted to be like my mom and wow. be an attorney. It's such a sweet story. And yeah. Then, so after almost a decade later, you've been doing this for over, over, about a decade now? Yes, here in the United States, okay. because I'm an attorney also in my country, the oh, Dominican really? Republic. Okay. Yes. And how long so, have you been? So how long have you been practicing in the, in the DA for? In the DR, I, the DR. Uh, yes, I, I started practicing in 2006. Okay. And then I came here to the United States okay. and took the bar exam okay. after I went to law school. Uh -huh. Passed and I have been practicing ever since. Wait, so why did you decide to come back, come here to the United States then? Well, you know what? It was... Um, the attraction to, to the system, to knowing a new system, mm. we are, uh, common law system is the New York, U.S. system. We are from the French law. Mm. The Dominican Republic is a codified uh, system in which everything is in codes and it's very archaic. But here it's, it's very much you do precedent while you go as you go the judges mm -hmm. make the precedent and i was very inspired by this mm -hmm. system that it's not really that codified and mm -hmm. the law can be changed and modified 
um, so easily. So I was very intrigued mm -hmm. and I decided to come here and see a different system and I also fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. So I do have to ask, so your native language is uh, Spanish? It's Spanish, yes. So, and then now you, law requires a lot of reading. Yes. So when you came to New York, so how was your English before you came here? Well, I went to a school um, where they taught me English okay. too. It wasn't as good. Mm. Um, of course, I had a very, very big accent mm. and I still do, but I know English. Mm. I also know French. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was um, trained in English, French, and Spanish, mm. but it is so different because mm. here you know like common English, but you don't know the lingo, the legal yeah, English, yeah, yeah. and it's the, a whole like, yes, another language. The in terminology. Time. So um, when I came here, I had to take some legal English classes. Okay and i had to study so hard to take the bar mm. exam it took me pretty much studying for three months mm. 16 hours a day with a dictionary in my hands to pass the bar exam because i had to look up the words that i didn't know mm. so it was very hard but very rewarding since i passed thank god <laughs> well, well take me back to that because i remember when i was in japan right i went to high school in japan and I had to take the SAT. Nothing, nothing, yes. nothing like the bar, but the SSAT. But you can imagine, I was, I was in Japan. I was having this glorious time. Or, you know, or everything's in Japanese. And then I had to get, go back oh and learn English, gosh. right? And um, so for me, I had, I was like studying. I was studying sixteen hours a day, but oh yeah, it was very glorious. You know, early night. I mean, late nights, early mornings. Uh, what kept you going? during that time how do you how are you able to you know sustain you know that that study and that work ethic for that long period of time because it's a long work day for a long period of time so how do you do that i think it's it's thinking more about the reward okay. at the end and staying focused on what your goal is and my goal was to pass the bar and become an attorney so that's all i had in mind i was not thinking about you know, I was tired. I was not thinking about what I had to eat. I was thinking about passing the bar exam. And it was a point in where you read so much that the letters become a blur and you are confused because you can, you reach a point in which you can't really read anymore because it's too much. Oh, you get a headache, right? So, yeah, so you take a break and a mental break and you know you go outside and you come back in full force and and you know follow what you have to do until you accomplish your goals so what i just got from that was you didn't think about the short-term pain Correct. you thought about the long-term reward yes right? exactly and so 10 years in now you've been doing this for you know over a decade obviously so before when you first got started what did you think you did and i'm gonna give you an example when I first got started with video production, I thought I was just doing videos. Oh, I'm just doing videos. But as I got more mature, I started to realize that I'm, you know, spreading communication within companies. I'm building their brand, right? So I, I got more deeper into what I, I understand what I do now. So how have you, now that you've been doing this for a long period of time, what do you think you're actually doing? What's, what, what are you actually providing for people? Well, I'm, I'm accomplishing justice. Okay. And this is my motivation. Justice, it's my goal. And the fact that I'm able to help people reach that goal and accomplish justice, it's what I do mm. and what drives me. Because I help people that are helpless. Mm. I help people that cannot represent represent themselves in a court of law so that is what i'm actually doing mm. it's it's just putting the balances a little bit you know leveled yes. in the justice system okay and then all right so i have this very basic question very basic very <laughs> fundamental basic is good but basic but i just want to i want to know what you okay. think about this can human beings exist without law I don't think so. Oh. I think that since the beginning of the times, mm. there always has to be 
some sort of law, some sort of system mm. that people have to follow so mm. that there is no chaos. Mm. Because if everybody's just doing whatever they want to do, there is always going to be this disorganized state. Mm. And that's how society has all has functioned since the beginning. Mm. You have to have certain parameters mm. to be able to, you know, um, have a society that works. Mm. So you need law to exist. That is correct. I think so as well. I'm glad we talked about how, you know, English isn't even in your first language and you were studying day in and day, day and night. You said for three months. Yes, for three okay. months after I finished my um, graduate degree, mm -hmm. um, I had to study for the bar okay. from May to July, okay. pretty much. And then, well, because people always say, oh man, that's an overnight success, you know. But one thing I like, uh, you sent me your resume. And before you even starting your own legal business, you actually have a plethora of background experience. So i like for you to kind of just go and you, like dig deep in your resume and just kind of talk about what you did. I'm going to start off with the Supreme Court of Justice. And this is around the time you just graduated and you worked at the Supreme Court of Justice, correct? Yes, um, that was in the Dominican Republic. Oh, okay, that was in the Dominican okay. I work at the Supreme Court. Mm. Um, I also work when I came here at the DA's office. Mm. Well, I used to volunteer. Okay. So it was pretty much while I was going to law mm. school, I used to also do all this volunteer work because I wanted to see what I like and um, what... I wanted to do after I graduated. Mm. So I started volunteering in all these places like the district attorney's office and some non-for-profit organizations mm. um, that were related to domestic violence and mm. family law mm -hmm. and also immigration law mm. for the Catholic Migration Office. And that's pretty much how I got the experience mm. Um, to start mm. as soon as I graduated. And with volunteering, it's, o it's always good. Um, in the entrepreneurial world, we work for free. We do a lot of working for free just to gain experience. First. That is correct. So, and that is as valuable as, you know, exactly. working for money. Actually, I'll give you an example. Actually, tonight, I'm going to work for free because I want to close a client. All right, so <laughs> hold up the story. <laughs> hold up the story. So, all right, but let's talk about that. So, you... You were in the DA, and this was around the time you were getting your master's and you was volunteering. So what, was, what were some of the things that you picked up earlier on you know, that kind of shaped you in the future? It, from the DA's office? Yeah, from the DA's, okay. Well, you know what? It was about how the justice system works. Mm. And while you are there in action, you can see, you can see it happen. You mm. can see both sides of the stories. You can see how it operates, how mm. the justice system operates, how the DA's office, which is the district attorney, uh, prosecutes the cases. And you can see also from the victim perspective and the defendant's per perspective, mm. um, how the system works. So mm. it was more about experience mm. and knowing from the beginning how I how the system work mm. and how I could approach the system while I was on the other side. Mm. And so I'm just very curious though. So what actually drew drew you to law? Because I look at you know some professions like uh, what's it, like video production. I, I do video production. That's the only thing I think of. Or video production or photography. Or, that's the only thing I think of at the moment. But we see the, the good side of you know people. You know we see the the beautiful, you know, us as human beings, a good side. But I might be wrong here, but just let me know. Like, in legal, you can you see the, the kind of negative sides of humanity. Is, is, am I, or I'm not, I don't want to you know, make, you know, make it sound bad, but like, basically, you're seeing, you know, the negative side. But what actually drew you to this? What actually say, you know what, I like this. I like doing this. I, I want to pursue this, rather than saying, ah, oh, this isn't for me. Why do you think... In addition to your mother, why do you think you pursued it, you know, um, yeah? Well, um, it's the fact of, and, and it comes back to my mother. Okay. My mother used to um, defend domestic violence victims. Okay. She was actually the first DA in all Latin America who applied the first law 
um, on defense of women mm. and uh, domestic violence rights. Mm. So the fact that you can take someone that is so vulnerable in a position in which she cannot help herself mm. and you in one, you know, just representing that person, you can make that person feel better and you can make things better. And yes, there is a lot of ugly. Mm. It's just like a police officer yeah, when, police when, when they see so, so much that it's going on, but at the same time, we can make a difference on mm. the other side. So that's what drove me, you know, the, the fact that you can balance um, and, and, and bring justice to the people who deserve it. I really respect this, and I'm taking notes if you see me looking down. I really respect this because, you know, there's a heaven and hell. And I think part of your job is going to hell to get people back to heaven. That is true. And because not a lot of people want to go to those, those deep and dark places. So I really admire you and uh, anybody in these uh, services. So I, I just kind of thought about that. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so after working at various different companies' jobs, why did you decide to say, okay, you know what? I want to do my own thing. Why did you decide to start, you know, Maria Mateo? Well, it was more of the community. Community, okay. I used to volunteer, like I said, and I gained a lot of experience. And my community started, you know, I referring me people, and mm. they were just, we need a Spanish speaking attorney. That's mm. very important for us because we cannot really identify with these. Um, attorneys who cannot explain in my language mm. what I need to know to mm. to defend myself and you know the community the community actually made me just say you know what I'm just gonna open my office I I have a lot of clients mm. um, that need my services and mm. it was just a no-brainer mm. so it's a natural stage of progression exactly okay and you said it was it was your, your language and your in your personable character so but a lot of it was your language as well because people needed to you know be able to communicate with a lawyer and understand what they're saying because there's a lot true. of words being thrown around that you know they probably wouldn't understand but you were able to do that by speaking the language that is correct okay. and a lot of things that happen um wrong in our court system is that people don't understand what they're pleading mm. and even if they do get a translator it's not the same if it's your mm. own attorney who's explaining mm. to you you know what are your options mm. and that makes a, a huge difference mm. so i do want to ask so what are the services that you provide at your i want how, is it company is it business is it, what, what do i call it your firm it's a it's okay, a law okay. firm. Okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't I didn't, I didn't know the terminology. <laughs> so, yeah, what are the services that you provide at your firm? Then? Well, um, like you said, we uh, provide family law. Um, in family law, matrimonial law, it's called. We do divorces. We do postnuptial and prenuptial agreements when people are gonna get married and after they get married. Mm. We do child support cases mm. and we also do custody and visitation cases. Um, and on the immigration side, we do work visas, we do family-based immigration, we do removal defense, which is a huge part of our business, just going to court and defending people who are detained. And pretty much everything immigration-wise mm. um, we do in this office. All right, and I do want to get to both Topics. Now, I understand you are a full, you just mentioned that you're a full service uh, legal firm. That is correct. I just want to tap into two, to, to, to two today because of the time <laughs> constraints, right? And I've always wanted to speak to people about these two topics. Like literally, since I started my interview series, I wanted to speak about this one thing. And uh, I just want to get right into it because I know you want to get into this as well. So, the big D word, divorce. So, what before we begin to divorce, I want to talk about a prenup. What is a prenup and just natural, a simple term? What's a prenup? It's a contract that okay. you sign before you get married. All right. And it's a legal binding document in which you just say, you know, when we, when we do get married, these are going to be the rules. Um, people usually do this to protect their assets. Mm. And if they have... Um, 
income they could say you know this is going to be my separate income mm. it's never going to be part of the marital assets mm. Mm. so you find ways to protect mm. um the parties and what they have mm. before they you know get married mm. and go through a divorce and it's mm. just just becomes messy when you are mm. uh, when you have assets and you go through a divorce so it's better just to prevent it mm. and have a prenuptial agreement before now, any of that happens now the more argument is if you get a prenup then you're not really committed to to the uh marriage i'm not going to get into that that's not <laughs> that's not your job that's not my job whatever um but who do you think should be what type of person what type of like a character if you can build up say like, okay this type of person should at least consider a prenup because I'm, I'm assuming that prenups aren't for every couple maybe that's my assumption i mean i could be wrong but What's the perfect type of uh, individual that would need a prenup? Well, that is a very personal um, decision. Okay. And maybe I cannot really categorize a type of person okay. because maybe today you do have money or some assets to protect. Mm -hmm. But maybe you don't have assets now and then later on you become this person uh, who makes so much money uh, and you didn't. Uh, put anything into a prenup uh, so pretty much nobody can predict the future mm. if you want to um, just avoid a messy divorce mm. it is you know recommended that you do a prenup mm. and in the process of the divorce it's going to be easier if you get married there is always that chance and that possibility that mm. it's not going to work out mm. so that's why you know Everybody should consider it, actually. And, and then at what stage, when should you consider it? I mean, would you, should you consider it? Is it one of the first? It's not probably not the first thing you should talk about at a date. You know, what's your name? Hello, what's your number? <laughs> you know, do you want a prenup? You know, but like, at what stage should couples start? Do you think couples should start talking about this? I think that when you're getting serious, mm. and if this is a huge issue for you, mm. and you actually think that if you're going to propose, and this is something that it's a deal breaker, you should bring it, up, bring it up as soon as possible because the clearer the situation, the clearer, you know, the less mess is going to be. If you wait until the last minute, you could make a decision based on, you know, um, you are in a hurry and, and you take the decision just mm -hmm. because you are in a hurry. Okay. So, you know, the sooner the better. And a post nup. So, would you, would you, what's a post nup? Is, is it a post nup? It, yes, it's a post nuptial agreement. Okay. It's the same as a prenup. You know, you establish okay. your what are gonna be your separate assets and mm -hmm. which ones are going to be um, the marital assets. Mm -hmm. But the only difference is that you sign the post nuptial agreement post nup after you oh, okay. get married. And so typically, what do you, what are some of the things that go into these agreements? You said assets. Is it is it always money? I heard people say something like dogs or like, you know, just furniture, <laughs> like houses. It, it, I'm, well, I'm assuming. in the state of New York, um, dogs are considered property. They are? Yes. Okay. So pretty much everything that it's, uh, could be divided in a mm -hmm. divorce and it's considered a marital property mm -hmm. should be included in a prenup in a prenup or a postnup. Okay. And and so what are some of these things like okay there's money of course and what are some other things? Well, like? if you do have kids, um, mm -hmm. you can also establish their, you know, maintenance mm -hmm. for your spouse and you can also establish, you know, other provisions mm -hmm. regarding um, your children mm -hmm. and you know everything that has to, that could be decided mm -hmm. in a divorce and when it comes to the divorce what's i know you're not a marriage counselor but <laughs> what's some of the typical things like it's very common things that you see people wanting to get a divorce for like well it's mainly i could say that a lot of the time is two reasons okay. one it's someone has been unfaithful oh. and the second one is economic reasons okay. mm. but I do see a tendency lately that people just are disposable people are disposable disposable what do you it's, mean by that? and what I mean by that is that people they, they don't have patience anymore they don't oh. they don't really 
um, want to work hard on their marriages. If they have issues, they just resolve to divorce um, so easily. And that is what I mean by that. You just go and move on to the next person that is there. And, and that's very sad. They're you not know? really trying to work on improving their marriage or fixing the problems. No. They just immediately jump to To divorce. the next, you know, uh, younger, better version of what you have. Uh, so what's your job as a lawyer? I know you said, I just said you're not a marriage counselor, but when you're dealing with such sensitive information like this, like this is a lot of emotion is going into this. So what, how do you approach this? Because it's not just a, just a, a word thing in your reading. It's, you have, you're dealing with humans here. So how do you approach your job when dealing with such sensitive you know, topics and situations? And, like and that is the hardest part that when you are dealing with family issues. Mm. There is that emotional part that you have to know how to navigate and you have to know how to work it. Um, a lot of people that come through the door, they're not sure if they want to get divorced or not. They, they just want to know their rights. Mm. And I tell them, you have, to, you have to make sure that this is what you want to do. You have mm. to make sure that you have exhausted all your, all your mm. options and that you don't want to work on this, uh, no. on this marriage anymore. Mm. Because there is that human part also, and mm. there are a lot of elements that um, go into a marriage, and there are kids, mm. and people's feelings. Mm. So it's, it's a very intricate and complex matter, mm. actually. Mm. And so when you approach this, and when you're sitting across the cross with someone, what's your demeanor like? Are are you more of a person, or are you more of a, or are you more of the lawyer? Like, how do you, how do you balance that? You know, dealing with touchy emotions. Like, how do, how do you balance that? Well, you know what, um, you your job is to be an attorney okay. and tell them the law. Okay. Okay. I usually do. Um, if I see that someone is troubled, I do tell them to go see a counselor. Mm. But somehow you're also a counselor because they're coming here and they are telling you mm. um, their issues. Mm. But what my job is, is to tell them legally what they're entitled mm. to and what they are not. Mm. And sometimes they feel better when they hear, you know, what their mm. legal options mm. are. Mm. And once you tell them, they immediately feel better when they leave, you know. Okay. So I've never had a divorce before, right? I don't even know how to get married. I don't know. That's not a conversation. Um, but anyway, uh, there is, it's going to be pretty, pretty dicey, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's this narrative out there, right, that the law heavily favors women. Do you think that's true? That is not true. Okay. And I'm a woman. And I've seen, and I represent a lot of you know, fathers in custody hearings, and it does not. Mm. Actually, what the law looks for is the best interest of the child. And when a child is involved, it's not if the mother is, is gonna have custody just because she's the mother. The person that is going to have custody is the person that it's the best parent. And in our jurisdiction, in the New York jurisdiction, the trend that we see right now is 50-50 custody. Okay. So judges more and more are trying for people to co-parent and have equal time. So basically, residential custody could be 50-50 and, and parents ha could have equal time. It, it doesn't really um, matter if you're a female or a male, okay. if you're the father of the mother. Um, that is not true. Okay. The law favors, you know, whoever is the best. Um, where it's for the best interest of the child. Okay, so if you are in the New York area and you are considering, you know, possibly getting some counseling, go contact Maria. I'll leave the information about that. But we're going to jump into immigration now. My second yes. favorite topic. I've been on both sides of the fence. I've been traveling for a few years, different countries. So I know the good and bad sides of immigration, right? And uh, so you spoke on some of the services you provide, you said working visas, um, detainment, you said detainment services? Yes, removal proceedings. Oh, removal proceedings. Um, so I have a question, like, if I wanted to enter the United States, or do you do it people coming into the United States, or people who oh, hold? Both. Both, all right. Both. All right, let's say I wanted to enter the United States. What would be the perfect way from 
another country, someone from another country to enter the United States. So it would be just the perfect, sweetest, easiest way to The enter. easiest way... Um, Not or, the easiest, I don't want to say easiest, but like the less friction. Well, it's, it's more about the best way. And the best way okay. is to enter legally, okay. you know, yeah, legally. through a port of entry. Okay. And you can enter different ways. You can request a visa if you qualify for a tourist visa. Mm -hmm. you, re you can request a work visa if mm -hmm. someone is sponsoring you. You can also come in as a family sponsor mm -hmm. visa if you have family in um, the United mm -hmm. States who mm -hmm. uh, qualify to be your sponsor. Mm -hmm. And if you're fleeing from persecution or torture, mm -hmm. you can also come in as, you know, as a refugee mm -hmm. or an asylum seeker. There are many ways that you can come in legally, legally into, okay. into the country. Um, well, would you say the less friction is either a spouse or work? Well, if you do have a sponsor. Okay, if you do have a sponsor. Yes, okay. but you can also, if you don't have a sponsor and you want to, those are um, visas that are not temporary. Those okay. are permanent visas mm -hmm. or green cards to come into mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. But if you actually want to come just for a visit, mm -hmm. you can also ask for a non-immigrant visa mm -hmm. and come in just, um, they, they'll give you a visa for a few years, but you can come in for mm -hmm. six months at a time. Uh, and I have a question. So what is the, because you work with different people, and if you look into, you know, uh, get these services, what is the definition of a good customer and what's the, what's the trait of a bad customer? Well, I, I would have to say that the good customer is the one that trusts me okay. and that let me do my, my job mm. and that trusts that I am, you know, protecting their interests. Mm. Um, some people want me to be in a hurry, mm. but when you are in a hurry, you can be quick, but you don't have to be in a hurry. Mm. You have to do things right. Mm. So the perfect customer for me is that one that we have that um, trust relationship and mm. that will let me do my job and mm. will trust and hear mm. what I, what I, you know, have to say. Okay. So in immigration, I just, I, I attended an event last, I think two weeks ago, and it talked about some of the negative things that go on immigration, like some of the, um, it doesn't get so pretty because it's people wanting to come into the country, they're eager to come and they're being taken advantage of, you know, so what are some things that, you know, People should be, I'm not, I'm not even going to get into that. There are some things that can go on with immigration that's bad because people come in there, they're being taken advantage of. How, if I'm looking to come in, or just in general, I'm looking to use an immigration lawyer, what are some ways that I can identify a professional lawyer versus a, a fraudulent one? Well, you know, an attorney needs to go to law school and pass the bar exam. Okay. So... There is a very easy way to check if you are if the attorney is registered in the mm -hmm. state. If you are practicing immigration law, you only need to be admitted by federal federal law. You only need to be admitted in one jurisdiction, and you can practice in the fifty states. Okay. So as long as you are admitted in one jurisdiction, you can practice um, throughout the United States. Mm. And for you to be able to provide legal advice you have to be a licensed attorney or an accredited representative. And for that, you need to be an attorney and nobody else except those two kinds of people could give legal advice, could represent someone in a court of law, or could even file a form. Filing an immigration form is considered a form of legal advice. Okay. And you said licensed attorney. Licensed attorney. And accredited. Or, yes, the accredited representatives are people like, for example, I used to work with the Catholic Migration Office, um, volunteering, and they are part of the church. And the VIA have actually um, given them that sort of license to represent people in immigration court, mm. but they have to be accredited. Okay. So. How can you know if this attorney practices immigration law? Mm. Um, the AILA, which is the um, American Immigration Lawyers Association, mm -hmm. which I belong to, have a list of all the immigration attorneys. Mm -hmm. You should uh, look them up there. 
and you will see if that person that presumes to be an attorney, it's an immigration attorney. Mm. In our countries, for example, in Latin America, attorneys are also notaries. And attorneys are also notaries, notaries. notary okay. public. Okay. In, in the United States, um, some people can be notaries without being attorneys. Okay. And these people fill out forms, fill out applications, and they do not have the legal background to mm. know if that form, any form that you file in immigration have an implication. If that form is denied, you could be referred to an immigration judge and be put on rem in removal proce proceedings. So a lot of people take advantage of that. And a lot of people, notary publics or you know, tax prepare preparers, practice immigration law without being an attorney. Mm. And people are under the assumption that because they're a notary public, they are attorneys mm. and they are not. And mm. they're not authorized to practice law unless they are, they are attorneys. So what are some questions that people can ask to, to ensure that their lawyers are actually accredited or you know, they're, um, they're licensed? What are the questions that people can ask to ensure that they're being you know, handled safely? Well, the best way is for you yourself to do the research. Okay. You could ask someone, are you an attorney? And they can pretend they're an attorney, okay. but you yourself can go to the um, bar association in your state okay. and you can look that person up and make sure that he's an attorney. You can look them up at the Immigration Lawyers Association, make sure they are an immigration lawyer. But another thing that we should take into consideration is that even if you're an attorney, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you cannot defraud people. Mm. So there are also a lot of unscrupulous uh, attorneys who will take money from the clients mm. and would not do anything mm. or would file something that is fraudulent. Mm. So because you are an attorney, that doesn't guarantee mm. that you're going to do a good job. Mm. You know, mm. you have to also use your, you know, senses and make sure that that person that you're talking to has you know, some sort of compassion mm. and, and can identify with your mm. problem. Mm. And that's what makes a difference because attorneys, we are, we all pass the bar. Mm. We all have the same training. Mm. We all have the same level. We're at the same level. But what makes that mm. difference is making sure that the attorney you're talking to it's compassionate towards mm. you and understand and can connect to a level and can understand that what you're going through. Mm. And that's also very important um, at the moment that you decide to retain an attorney. Mm. So I just heard a plethora of ways to, to, to identify uh, professional attorneys, but what, I, what it boils down to is you actually doing the research on these individuals and just kind of using your intuition you know, to see if this person is right for you. That and is correct. I just have a question, like, because we're becoming more global. And you know, people are traveling in other countries. It's actually more, much more frequent now. What are some ways that you know, U.S. as a country, everybody wants to come here, and um, that's why some people even do it illegally. You know, but um, everybody wants to come to a country like the U.S. Um, we do things both good and bad. But from your perspective, what are some things that we can be doing to improve, you know, the immigration system here in the states? Well, um, the immigration system in the United States, it's on a crisis level. Okay. Um, there are many things that are right now going wrong that okay. could be improved. But for that, it's going to need a bipartisan, you know, approach. And the political parties have to come together in this subject and try to reach an agreement. Mm. And a lot of the things that we need right now to accomplish is, first of all, we need to legalize the millions of immigrants that are here mm. in this country already, you know, contributing to our economy, to our mm. growth, to our labor force. We have to help our businesses also thrive and immigrants contribute to the businesses being able to grow and, and, and perform and have employees that work for them. So it's very important that we legalize, um, you know, the people that are here. Mm -hmm. For example, the DACA recipients, DPS holders who have been here for a really long time and have been contributing to our society. First step. So the first step is to legalize the people that are here.
And I understand that our country needs to secure the borders, mm -hmm. but I do believe that what we need is to actually utilize the resources that we have in a better way. Um, for example, we do have USCIS and we have ICE and we have CBP. We have to hire and train humane people working in these institutions. We have to have a better system to screen the people who come in through the ports of entry. We have to have a better immigration justice system. We have to have an independent justice system. Mm. Judges independent from the Department of Justice. Mm. Because right now, it's not working. We have a backlog of cases that has been created by USCIS denying all these cases, referring them to immigration judge. And right now we have 900,000 cases that are pending mm. and that does not he said 900,000 900,000 cases right now in 2019 that are waiting to be you know people that are waiting to have their day in court uh. and that's a backlog that USCIS is creating right now so we need to hold USCIS accountable okay. Congress needs to do something to hold USCIS accountable and USCIS needs to stop working as an enforcement agent and more as a you know agency that provides services to immigrants wow. and we have only 400 judges in the united states and 900,000 cases so you could imagine how uh, disastrous and how awful and right now the waits are for immigrants to just see a judge and get the, their day in court. Mm. So we need to reform our immigration um, system, but we need a bipartisan support for this. It cannot be done by one political party. Both par parties have to, you know, come together and, and work in a solution in this subject. But question, why do you think we, why do you think it's like this? Why do you think we have this com obvious you know, this disparity in, in judges to cases. Why do you think we're overlooking this? Well, here's why. First of all, because USCIS, it's delaying cases. For example, USCIS have delayed in 2018, 46% more cases than in previous years. So it's almost a 50%. That doesn't mean that there are more applications because people applying for benefits went down six, 17%. Okay. So what the policies that USCIS are implementing right now are, for example, interviews for all cases, which are delaying the process. Mm -hmm. They are, before they used to send a request for evidence, if let's say, for example, you miss pictures, and you didn't send your application with your passport pictures. Mm -hmm. Now they deny the applications. They don't give you the opportunity to send the pictures. Mm -hmm. They just deny the application and refer you to an immigration judge. So now all the USCIS cases that are being denied mm -hmm. are being referred to an immigration mm -hmm. judge for removal. Mm -hmm. So there are so many people right now waiting because mm -hmm. USCIS is creating this chaos mm -hmm. and it's, it's really bad. Judges are actually complaining about the caseload that they have. They cannot handle it. You think? Yes. The other thing that is happening is that the judges are getting quotas. Mm. And with these quotas, they have to speed, speed up the cases. Like if they're given a traffic ticket, they have oh. to have um, a year seeing 600 asylum. Let's, mm. let's, as, that's one um, amount that they mentioned last year. And they are being tracked with what it's called speedometer. Mm. And it's a meter that tracks the cases that the judges are, you mm. know, handling. Mm. And that creates that if you are an immigrant and you are on these deadlines, you cannot present your evidence. Mm. You cannot have due process because mm. The judges are just working overtime, mm. overload, and, 
and they're just being pressured by uh -huh. the Department of Justice. And I'm assuming with that overload, they're just looking at cases and just making very quick judges and saying, you know, we're just going to do this. Yes. Like, okay, that's yes. It. They're not really given, like you said, due process to look at a case, really investigate, look at all the information, and, and do the, their due diligence. So that's kind of ramping up the process, and the quality has been decreasing as well. That is correct. This is really eye-opening. Um, I didn't think we were this bad. I mean, I know... Everybody wants to come to America, and I, I just feel as if, this is feelings, it's my emotions, but I'm, I'm not a lawyer, whatever. So uh, I just feel as if, if a, if a country is this great, uh, people want to come here, we should have better systems, you know, to ensure that everybody has their, their due process. So you open my eyes to a lot. Um, I do empathize with immigration because I've had a lot of friends, and I, said, um, I myself have been on both sides of immigration. and. Just on a global scale, you know, not just the United States. Obviously, you see things like Brexit in the UK. Um, just on a global scale, like, what do you think we can be doing better just as a humanity when it comes to immigration? Well, you know, immigration has always been part of history. Mm. People migrate. Mm. This is just what happens, and it's going to happen um, from one country to the other, depending on the conditions. People just move and migrate and, and they go to where they could find a better life, depending on what's happening in their countries or the, what they want for themselves at that point. Mm. But, you know, we as the countries um, have human rights and we have as accepted, including the United States, mm. a human rights agreement. Mm. and. What we have to guarantee is that the human rights are, you know, actually guaranteed for people and that when people migrate, at least they have their basic human rights protected. Mm. But on another note, we also have to look at why people are migrating. People just, they just don't want to leave their countries because something has to happen for them to say, you know what, let's pack our stuff and just go. Mm. So in a global sense, we also have to look, let's say the Northern Triangle and Guatemala, El Salvador and Honduras, why people are migrating? Mm. Why are we taking the aid that we were giving those countries? Mm. Instead of taking the aid, we should be helping, helping them economically get better, you know, with what's going on with the murder rates. Mm. We, should be able, we should be able to help these countries get better so that they don't have to migrate mm. here. So it's, it's also a global compromise that oh. we have to do to resolve this mm. issue. So what you're saying is that people are migrating to escape some of the, the pains of their own countries. And instead of just looking at migration, what's causing this migration, and let's, let's solve those problems, and then maybe they can, if we, basically, if we improve the livelihood and the lives of people in their own countries, they wouldn't have to feel the necessity to escape and leave their own Absolutely. countries. Absolutely. All right. And uh, so I just have a final couple of questions here to wrap up. Wow. <laughs> that was really intense. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so first, I, I do want to go back. And on a lighter, lighter scale, your social media, you just reached uh, 10K followers. Yes. Today is like 9,900. <laughs> right? <laughs> but no one's I don't know. I don't but, know. But no one's coming. You reached 10,000. But and by the time it's, uh, it's published, you reached 10,000. Um, why? And I've done a lot of research on other um, uh, law firms. They don't, really, like, they don't really do the social media. So why did you, well, first off, how has social media impacted your brand and, and this law firm? Tremendously. Actually, I started the social media because of the live videos. Okay. And people know that every Thursday, not today, but every Thursday, mm. I go online and I answer questions mm. from people who cannot come here to mm. do you know, a consultation. And it's been just so fun. And, mm. and people just wait for Thursdays mm. to, to connect with me. And, and, and it's a pretty interesting way to, you know, acquire more business and, and be in touch with the people out there that are using social media. Yeah, you and my sister, you just have like a just natural <laughs> inclination to social media. I need to learn it, you know. And then 
I'm going to ask a, a deeper question. I never asked this before. My brother said he wants to know this question. Okay. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's going to take you back a little bit. But what do you think? I know you have to go here. What do you think is the relationship between success? No. What is the role of God in success? Well, I think if you don't have God, you can't reach or achieve anything. Mm. You need to have faith in something. And I do have faith in God, and that's a very good question. Everything that I do, it's because of Him, and everything that I have, it's because of Him. So faith is a very important part of my business and what I do and my whole life. Mm. Well, I truly appreciate it. Um, just one last question before I let all my guests go. Um, find a couple questions. Urgency or patience? You know, I think um, a little bit of both. You need to have... One or the other, one or the other. Patience is always better, uh, but you also need to be quick. Okay. You know, you don't need to be in a hurry. You need to be quick. Okay. But patience always wins. Okay. And then um, hard work or smart work? I'm a hard worker, okay, hard work. but I think, you know, your questions, you think they can be one or the other, but actually I'm a hard worker and the way that I work, I think it's also smart. Okay. You're dodging, dodging these questions, dodging them. No, I'm not, but you questions. know, they yeah. have a little bit of both. Order in the court, man. <laughs> and then uh, favorite day of the week, do you have one? Yes, I do. It has to be Sundays when yeah. I'm with my family, with my kids, with my husband, and yeah. at home just enjoying life. And last question, New York and one word. Energy. Energy. Well, you might just move to the side of my camera right there. Thank you so much for watching this video. Would you mind telling my camera where people can find you? My name is Maria Mateo, and you can find me in Queens, New York at 125-10. Queens Boulevard, Suite 320, Kew Gardens, New York, 11415, and my phone number is 718-268-0384. Email mariamateolo at gmail.com. Perfect. You heard it here. We spoke about many different things. I want to really applaud you. And I, again, one of the main things that I think about you is, and just people in your field in general, you see the negative, you see the bad that's going on in humanity, and you're actually going and digging in the trenches to, to pull people out of that. So I really appreciate that. Thank Your you. Your relationship with God and success. That was a really risky question for me because not everybody's <laughs> religious. But you answered it. Thank you so much. Of course. And you just strike me as someone, not just strike me, but you are obviously a person that puts in the work. You know, you def from volunteering, you know, doing free work. And um, like, I understand. I speak a second language. To learn a second language and then learn... A, a specialty in that language. Oh my goodness. It's hard. ridiculous. Ridiculously hard. <laughs> so I applaud you on that. Thank, thank you, you for very all your much. work. And thank you for watching this episode. If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel. And remember, be great. Cheers. Thank you. Beautiful.